This is Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. I'm the only lawyer ever to obtain a court ruling that a president of the United States committed a crime. For truth, for competition. As a young lawyer, I helped break up AT&T. That's why you have all your cell phones today. For sovereignty, for the republic. I'm the guy who, at Judicial Watch, which I founded, uncovered the Chinagate scandal. Millions of dollars going to the Clinton campaign, corrupting our political system. For the privacy of citizens. And I'm the only guy to have enjoined the National Security Agency from mass surveillance on hundreds of millions of Americans. Tearing it up. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. Bringing it back. We're going to take this country apart and put it back together again in the way envisioned by our founding fathers. It's not just talk. We're not just regurgitating news stories. Larry Klayman, special prosecutor, is making the news. And now, here's Larry. Welcome to this week's edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. As usual, we have another hard-hitting and timely show. Co-hosting today with me is my good friend and someone who I admire a great deal because He tells the truth. His name's Jason Goodman. He's the owner and CEO of Crowdsource the Truth. I urge you to go and listen to his shows. I'm on there frequently. So are others. Because there are very few people out there today who are willing to tell it like it is. It's couched usually to try to help their interest, to promote their interest. Jason, like yours truly, is trying to help the interest of our country. So, Jason, welcome to Special Prosecutor with Larry Clayman. And also, I've kind of I have a double name now. I'm special defense counsel with Larry Klayman when it comes to Dr. Larry Corsi and the Bundys and a host of others because of the tyranny that's being practiced by our Department of Injustice. But I want to get into another injustice right up front and get your feedback on it. This week, the president met with the dictator of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. He went over there in good faith to try to work peace out on behalf of the American people in the world. And he tried to do it with regard to denuclearizing. That's a tough thing to pronounce, but I got it right. Denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. While that happened, these evil, despicable, vile, corrupt, dishonest Democrats on Capitol Hill. And, you know, I'm nonpartisan. I've sued George W. Bush. I've sued Dick Cheney. I've sued them all. If you're Republican, Democrat or what color you are, black, white, green, yellow or gray. I don't care. Um, We're in it for justice. But these Democrats are out to destroy the president. And in doing that, they don't care about the United States. They're destroying the United States. So at the same time that he's meeting with the Korean dictator, they're holding this hearing with this legal and political hack, Michael Cohen, the president's former lawyer. And they're humiliating him on television. They're laying the foundation for impeachment, which will clearly result in the next few weeks, then we're going to have a Senate trial to try to destroy everything this president is trying to accomplish. And if you're Kim Jong-un and you're sitting there and you're seeing that the president of the United States is being attacked so viciously, the president admitted yesterday he actually hate watched some of this stuff while he's trying to yeah. negotiate peace and, and who wouldn't. If you're sitting there and you're Kim Jong-un, aren't you saying to yourself, gee, can I make a deal with somebody who might not be around in less than two years and, and probably won't get reelected? In 2020, I mean, that's the perspective from North Korea. I'm not saying that Trump isn't going to be reelected, but you don't make a deal where you're agreeing to give up all your nuclear weapons with the president who's having his legs cut out from under him. So this was an act of treason. These people have committed uh, sedition against the United States. They themselves should be impeached. That's where the impeachment should come from. You know, the Demo- the Republicans who squandered their control of the House of Representatives have no power to impeach anybody. You know, they, they can go down to Baskin and Robbins and get some peach ice cream, but that's about as far as they're going to go. And <laughs> they're going to call Mitt Romney. This is a terrible situation, and I want to get your feedback because no one's telling it like it is. Typical Fox News, they shade it. I'm listening to Lindsey Graham, head of the Judiciary Committee. Gee, maybe it wasn't quite kosher to do this when the president's overseas. No, it's treason, and that's something I'll say. It's something you'll say, and it's something anybody that cares about this country will say. Yeah. I mean, Larry, it's terrible. This thing was just a Lanny Davis special, as you would say. And Lanny Davis was sitting there behind Michael Cohen, nodding his head, shaking his head. He could barely control his body language. It was as if he knew the script Michael Cohen was reading from. I was, I was waiting for Lanny Davis to mouth the words that were coming out of Michael Cohen's mouth. We should add 
This guy is a uh, convicted felon for lying to Congress. He's about to go to prison, and he's a self-proclaimed fool. Why would he be the witness? You raise a good point, Lenny Davis. I think I'm the only lawyer in Washington, D.C. who's ever sued Lenny Davis. That was during the Clinton years. Who is Lenny Davis? He is the Yale classmate of Bill and Hillary Clinton, the Bonnie and Clyde of American politics. Slick Willie and the Wicked Witch of the Left, I call them. <laughs> nice duo. Not exactly Warren Beatty, you know, and, and uh, the actress who played the role. I just watched her last night in a movie, <laughs> which was Faye Dunaway. three days of the condor. Faye Dunaway, yeah. So, you know, he is, number one, a Clinton loyalist. Number two, he worked for the law firm. He was a partner in the law firm of Patton Boggs and Blow, who invented legalized bribery, Hale Boggs. In other words, what they did is they raised money for political candidates, and they call in the chips, okay? That's to bribe these political candidates on Capitol Hill or wherever to do what you want to do. Sleazy law firm. He's no longer with that sleazy law firm. He started his own sleazy law firm. And in that law firm, he's run interference for the Democrats, and he's trying to destroy Trump, and he wants to be the big hero. And the stupid Michael Cohen, who went to the worst law school in world history, I don't even remember what it is. That's how bad it is. No one knows, has ever heard of it. Okay, a fixer, a greaser, whatever your case may be. And I'll talk about my advice to the president, who I love, that he needs to stop associating with these kinds of people. It's dragging him down. Is that Michael Cohen sold out by Lenny Davis. They didn't even get a cooperation agreement with special counsel Robert Mueller or the Southern District of New York, the U.S. attorney there. Uh, he was led to believe that Lenny Davis was going to be his messiah, his legal messiah, and that he would come out scot-free. Well, the guy's, you know, facing time right now, and he may do more time. So Lanny Davis sends him out there because he's the dumbest lawyer ever to, to have lived, probably, Michael Cohen. I mean, all he was was a bag man. That's all he was. And a distinguished he now goes in front of Congress and jeopardizes himself more with, with more perjurious testimony. Yeah. The Thomas M. Cooley Law School graduate. Thomas M. Cooley, okay. You know who that is? I, I've never heard of it. You know, it's, well, according I to the media, he's a distinguished American sociologist and the charter member of the Interstate Commerce Commission. I never heard of him before. Okay. Well, whatever. But, I mean, you're absolutely right, Jason. And, you know, this guy is a sleazeball extraordinaire. It's a, it's a good combination, Davis and Cohen. Maybe they can start their own uh, law firm, you know, in – in some other country, who knows? I mean, you know, go overseas. You can join Ilham Omar, you know, and, and start one over in uh, Sudan or something like that. But yeah, I, but these are very sleazy people. And, and, and this is the criticism. This is the only criticism I have of the president. He's done really good things. He's come of age. You know, whatever he may have done in the past, he's trying to represent the American people today. He's doing a, a fantastic job. I think he's going to turn it out if he survives. And that's that's in doubt right now. He's going to turn out to be one of our greatest American presidents. I do believe. And I love the guy because he says what he thinks. He's the only one ever, you know, to talk about how the judges are politicized to make decisions based on biases. He'll talk about the corruption at the Justice Department, which he oversees. He should be doing more about that. Uh, and he should be taking the advice of Giuliani, Giuliani and Sekulow. By the way, Sekulow was implicated in alleged crimes by a uh, Cohen. Uh, I doubt that Jay committed any crimes. He's not, you know, the best guy to be representing Trump because he's not a criminal defense lawyer, but he's a good guy. I know him to be an honest guy. Uh, Giuliani, he's got his issues. Uh, he drinks before he goes on TV and says stupid things and reveals attorney-client confidences. And that gets into another issue about Cohen revealing attorney-client confidences. Giuliani do his, does it inadvertently. Cohen does it on purpose and was disbarred in part for doing that. But, you know... The president has hung around with some really bad people in the past. And, you know, he and Cohen is, is the primary example of that. Now it's coming back to bite him, bite him in the rear end. So, Jason, that, that's my only criticism of the president going forward. He's got to jettison these people, you know, and these people you know, that have gotten I, into I, trouble. Yeah. I think a lot of people just think that, you know, if you're in the right and the other party is in the wrong, you just go to court and everything's going to work out. But something that we're learning a lot about during the Trump presidency is this lawfare where, you know, people like Lanny Davis can stage these public 
kind of hearings that uh, really sway the public opinion. And you look at something like this piece of evidence of the check that uh, Michael Cohen presented, you know, ostensibly as some kind of smoking gun. This is just a check written from Donald Trump's personal account to his lawyer, a $35,000 a month retainer doesn't seem unreasonable for a billionaire to have one of the many lawyers he would have on retainer, does it? You're right. There's no campaign finance violation here. He used his own money. I mean, even the leftist law professor Dershowitz, Alan Dershowitz, says that there are real campaign violations by Hillary Clinton. I know that going back to the year 2000 in the 2000 uh, election when she was running for the Senate in New York. She raised $2 million of hard campaign contributions, about $1,998,000 over the limit. Nothing happened to her because Bruce Orr covered it up. He was head of the criminal division. I was actually trying to get her indicted then with my client Peter Charlie Paul, who Treat? came for it. Money from China Char to Bill Clinton's campaign. Charlie, Charlie Treat. There's Treat. no campaign. Yeah, there's no campaign finance violation. The only crime that the president committed was to have Michael Cohen as his lawyer. That was criminal and uh, yeah. stupid. You yeah. know, and I don't I don't want to get into it because I'm under a gag order. But <laughs> there are a number of other people that he's also been by virtue of representing my client, Dr. Corsi, but there are a number of other people he was really stupid to be in bed with, too. And he needs to learn going forward that you are who you're, you associate with. When you associate with people like this, the odor wears off onto you. And, and, and now the president is sadly paying a price for that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that it's so happening we're, while he's in Korea, in uh, Vietnam negotiating with Kim Jong-un of Korea is, is so short-sighted. They could have easily made it begin on Monday after the president was done. And whatever happened to this notion that politics stops at the war? Yeah, we're going to have to come back. We're at a break right now, uh, Jason. So we'll be right back with the second segment, and we'll pick this up. Thanks. Special Prosecutor, Very bad. Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. We're back with Jason Goodman. Jason, I didn't mean to cut you off. Continue with your thought, because your thoughts are usually very profound. Thank you, Larry. I, I just was wondering why this president has not extended the courtesy that every other president of either party has been in the past, this notion that politics stops at the water's edge, allow the man to do the international diplomacy that would benefit many nations of the world rather than this bickering and, uh, you know, the infighting that's going on over nonsense and fake evidence. Because they don't care. Because you say, do you ever read Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged? Okay. Uh, We're uh, living yeah, in that age. Right. Okay. Yeah. Everybody is supposed to be the same. Soon we'll all have one name, like after the French Revolution. I don't know. Maybe we'll all be called Zeke, you know, or, or women will be called Betty. I don't know. Everything... You know, has gone upside down. There's no achievement anymore. Look at the California university system. You can't say if you're a professor that we're a land of opportunity. It'll make people feel bad. I and mean, we're going to talk about this a little more. We've got actual representatives of Congress supporting uh, so-called President Maduro in Venezuela because he's a socialist and because he's allowed Iran in there and Al-Qaeda uh, to infiltrate that country. Uh, we'll talk about Ilham Omar the Muslim congresswoman from Minnesota who came out yesterday in support of Maduro. Unbelievable. Wow. Uh, this is what we're talking about here, is that they're trying to destroy the country. They're trying to drag it down, to take it down to ground zero, like an Atlas shrug, and then recreate it in the image of a socialist, communist, atheist, pro-Islamic, pro-radical gay, lesbian, and transgender, pro-illegal immigrant, pro-radical African-American and radical Jewish left state. And I'm Jewish and you are too, so we don't mean that anti-Semitically. So what we're talking about here is a full court press. And these Democrats who have become socialist slash 
communists, that's what they are, are trying to destroy this country. They're making an overt effort to do that, and they don't care if that means that North Korea is going to have 78 nuclear warheads, which they currently have, trained on Japan, on everybody else in the Far East, capable of hitting the United States. They already have that. They don't care. And yet they profess that it's terrible that you're talking to Russia, terrible you're talking to the communist regime of North Korea. These people are communists. I mean, what hypocrisy in this regard. So, Jason, that's where we're headed. I want to shift now into this full court press by this radical left, this coalition of groups trying to destroy the country, uh, because it's not just them in, on Capitol Hill. It's not just the violence in the streets of Antifa, Black Lives Matter, and others, but these judges. I mean, 90 percent of them were Clinton and Obama appointees. I mean, they're tearing this country down, too, a lot of them. There's some good ones, like Judge Ronald Gould in the Ninth Circuit. And he made a decision yesterday for a Muslim that I agree with, says that the government can't shut down a case by a citizen who's a Muslim simply because they can claim national security not to let it go forward. Mm. I mean, there are good liberals out there. You can't do that. I don't care who you are if you're an American citizen. But yet we have a full court press. We have bar associations under entertaining disciplinary complaints against Kellyanne Conway because she made a remark that liberal bar professors don't like on Fox News. Justice Kavanaugh, who I don't like, period, okay? But you know what? He should have gotten a fair shake at the hearing. I don't like him because his views on the Fourth Amendment, not because he harassed some woman. That was completely a sham. 2,000 law professors filed ethics complaints against him. And now we have Matt Goetz, who, who simply before the hearing with Michael Cohen says, well, Cohen should be careful. He's had affairs with all these women. It may come out. He winds up with bar complaints filed by liberal bar, uh, liberal professors. You know, and it's not just the liberal professors. They're bad conservative ones, too, or, or, or moderate ones. But, but the whole area here, the whole country is turned upside down. We are on the verge of revolution, as I've said. And, you know, I want to, you know, get your feedback because you, you tell the truth to crowdsource the truth. Go there and see what, what Jason does. He does a great job. Well, Larry, my question is, is Kellyanne Conway even a lawyer? Can you put in a bar complaint against someone who's not a member of the bar? Well, she is a lawyer. As a fact, she's on administrative uh, suspension from the D.C. bar because she didn't take her, her – uh, she didn't pay the dues. So I mean, they didn't care that uh -huh. she's technically not a lawyer of the D.C. bar. They, they brought a complaint anyway. It's, it's unreal. And, you know, we got about 15 seconds left. We'll pick it up on the other end of, of the – the break here, but there's a lot of other hypocrisies out there today. I want to talk about <clears throat> these two Muslim congressmen who have infiltrated Congress. It's not that they're Muslims, that they're radicals. They're people that are trying to destroy the country. We'll be right back. that make corrupt politicians make wee-wee in their little pants. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this president. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Special Prosecutor, Larry Klayman. Be the one who makes our country great again. Go to freedomwatchusa.org and donate. I'm back with Jason Goodman. We were talking about the two Muslim congressmen Elon Omar and Talib. Omar recently said that she supports President Maduro, to use the term loosely, president in Venezuela, who is terrorizing his people. It's unbelievable. Of course, she believes in, in Maduro because Maduro has let the door, opened the door to Iran and terrorists like Al Qaeda. And of course, Omar has cavorted around with terrorists. She's speaking with some of them as, as we speak these days. And the other one, you know, was very critical of the president the other day during the hearings with Michael Cohen. It comes as no surprise they hate the president. The president's a strong supporter of Israel. His son-in-law is Jewish. These people hate Jews. They hate Christians. Uh, they Frankly, they hate everybody. But in any event, uh, Jason, give me your, uh, your take on all this, of what's going on in Congress and the infiltration of Muslims into Congress and, and other Groups that are frankly trying to destroy this country, in my opinion. And like I said, not all Muslims are bad people. 
But these people are yeah. bad people. It's very disconcerting, Larry. I mean, you know, Laura Loomer has been on my show a number of times, and she brought it to my attention that in 2004, I believe, or 2007, an FBI raid on a home in Virginia uncovered a Muslim Brotherhood document called the Explanatory Memorandum, which is a manifesto. It's a plan. It's an infiltration plan. They state in there, in their own words, in the same way the PNAC talks about events that mirror 9-11, this explanatory memorandum talks about the desire to create an Islamic caliphate in North America and to infiltrate our culture and our society. So when I see uh, freshman representatives in Congress being sworn in on the Koran, I mean, I personally believe everyone in Congress should be sworn in on the Constitution and the Constitution only. The difference, as far as I know, between the Koran and the Bible is that the Koran talks about the law by which they are to live. Now, I mean, the Bible does as well, but it's talking about don't kill people, don't steal. These are things that we've all agreed to. The Koran is talking about you're uh, authorized and even encouraged to lie to infidels and non-believers to forward this goal of having, you know, what they consider God's religion take over. So it's clearly stated, and when Laura tries to bring this to people's attention, she gets banned from Twitter, she gets banned from PayPal, she gets banned from banking, and I find it very troubling to look into some of these major companies, specifically in the case of Twitter, Citigroup, these major holdings from Al-Walid bin Talal, who uh, I think it was Zakarius Musawi who said he was a financier of 9-11, he owned the top four floors of the hotel in Las Vegas where the shooting occurred. I have a lot of questions about Al-Walid bin Talal and what his motivations are. And when we see people in Congress who seem to be maniacally focused on impeaching Donald Trump, irrespective of evidence, using foul language and, uh, you know, basically just acting like high schoolers in the middle of Congress, it's not good. No, it's not good. And of course, you know, as we said before, uh, the president is going down a slippery slope now. We're doing what we can to defend him at Freedom Watch. He doesn't really have lawyers that do much of anything. Uh, we've got people now as we speak at CPAC in Washington, D.C., who are patting themselves on the back and giving each other awards. I might add, I'm not there. I mean, I've been there in the past. I used to go. I don't go anymore because, frankly, I don't like those people. I mean, they're basically lobbyists. Some of the people they invite are good, but you know how you get to speak? It's, it's CPAC, Jason. You pay them a lot of money. And my former group, Judicial Watch, since 2012, you can look at their 990s on their website at judicialwatch.org, has paid them a quarter of a million dollars. So yeah, for a quarter of a million dollars, you get to speak and say what you want as the rest of us are getting banned on social media. Yeah. And for $250,000, Jason, I could be named the greatest lawyer that ever lived in this universe and any other. So you know, that, that presents the, the importance of what we do in trying to get the word out and bringing about justice. And this is the hypocrisy today. I want to shift to another subject I've been meaning to raise on radio shows. I'm a proud alumnus of Duke University. Uh, you know, and I, I had a, a really nice time being there. You can read about it in Horace Why and How I Came to Fight the Establishment. It really cemented my Jewish heritage, uh, Messianic, of course, I believe in Jesus. Uh, but, you know, it was the first time I ever experienced anti-Semitism. It was the summer, uh, a uh, Southern school, you know, at that time. They, had, they hadn't met too many Jewish people in those days. But I loved Duke. My dad said, stay, you know, you have to learn how to deal with these things. I wasn't a snowflake or anything like that. And I started taking courses and learning about Judaism and Christianity and, and all these things. And it was really a great school and I had a great education. But, you know, I'm really saddened by the what's happened to it and, and other universities. And let's talk about sports a little bit here. Because when I went to Duke, unfortunately, they didn't have a great basketball team at that time. It was one of the few times in Duke history they didn't. But to be a member of the basketball team, you had to have certain academic credentials. You had to have SATs over a certain level. Uh, when you came in as an freshman, you didn't play on the varsity. You played on the junior varsity for a year so you could study, you know, and learn. And you graduated. 
in today's world in sports, and this shows you the degradation of our country, so I want to discuss it, is that these people come in, you know, and there's no expectation that they even make it past the freshman year. Duke has the best basketball team in the country this year, other than the fact that Zion Williamson got hurt, you know, for the last few games. He's a, a LeBron James type. But he's going to be gone at the end of the year, and so will all of the other freshmen who are the team. And now you have people out there talking about that these basketball players in college should be paid. You know, they are being paid. They're getting an education if they stay. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the payment. That's a very important payment. And the very fact that there's a discussion about this, or that someone like Coke Mike Krzyzewski, who I respect, goes along with the charade at the NAACP, bringing people in only for a year that have no expectation of either studying or graduating, to me is unbelievable. What do you think, Jason? I mean, this, this is symptomatic of our society, that even college sports is being corrupted. I think we've seen a lot of things deteriorate at the university level, Larry. I mean, the thing that's interesting is, you know, my industry, my former industry in Hollywood is, you know, rapidly affected by changing technology. Uh, first, it was digital acquisition of motion pictures and then obviously digital distribution of motion pictures. And I think that traditional universities for many people have become just way too expensive uh, and unnecessary when you think about it, because what are you doing in college? I mean, you're sitting in lectures and you're reading books. Now, setting aside the social component of university, which I find very important, if someone was strictly interested in education, well, you can watch lectures from universities around the world on the Internet, and you can read books from any library on the Internet. So in many ways, I think these universities are struggling to remain relevant, and I guess propping up their sports teams might be one way that they choose to do it, but it just speaks to the level of corruption that people are willing to accept on every single level. And uh, I think it's important that we point it out and everyone's got to take an individual responsibility to not allow it to happen or that, you know, that's how it goes all the way up to the top. You're right. I mean, society is crumbling from the top to the bottom yeah. and now it's getting in, into sports. You know, it, it's unreal. I mean, forget about stuff like, you know, the owner of the, the New England Patriots getting picked up for soliciting prostitution. I mean, you know, that's not good either, but it's not the biggest thing in the world. You know, it was consensual. And what I'm talking about here is an inherent corruption. And, you know, in the university system in California and elsewhere, and I now call Duke the Berkeley of the South, unfortunately. I, I don't even want my kids to go there anymore, yeah. you know. But, you know, if you can't learn good values— in university, I believe that I did when I went to Duke. Duke was a fine school. And uh, I never really even saw, and I was there during the Vietnam War, you know, much protest towards that. I'm not saying that was good because it turned out that the Vietnam War was obviously more than a bad idea. But yeah. there was some respect, and there's no respect anymore. And just a few years ago, the chancellor let, for, let Muslim prayer occur in the Duke chapel, you know, and then when that got objected to because the alumni were pulling out the funds. They let it occur right in the middle of campus so people couldn't even pray in the library anymore with, you know, five times a day, <laughs> horns blasting. I mean, whether you're pro-Muslim or not pro-Muslim, you know, whether you should respect religion or not respect religion, I do believe that we should respect legitimate religion. You know, you don't disrupt an entire campus because, you know, it's politically correct. And this is what we're going through today. And this this is what's shaping our young kids uh, in college uh, going out into the real world. And when they see that their basketball team is simply a bunch of professionals that don't really care about studying in, in the best basketball school in world history, uh, it's more than a bad joke. Well, soon there'll be transgendered basketball players, Larry. Well, I mean, I don't know. There probably already are for all. There was there was it's, a transgender woman who broke a record in some sporting event recently. I mean, that seems to be where more of the focus is, trying to educate people about, uh, you know, false things like carbon dioxide is destroying the environment rather than teaching people critical thinking and asking real questions like, you know, is uh, permanently altering your body the solution to a gender dysmorphia or a body dysmorphia issue?
Well, you know, and I, there's a libertarian streak in me, Jason. I believe people can do what they want as long as they don't harm other people. You know, I'm not right. a believer in use of marijuana or drugs because that does harm other people because people lose control. Or for that matter, alcohol. I don't drink. You know, it's, it's just something I stopped doing. I lost the taste for it. And I don't like being around people that are drunk. Frankly, I'll walk out of a room. But when they start pushing it on you, you see, that's the thing. When it's corrupting, you know, university that you loved and, and you respected that I went to, uh, or when it, it enters into, you know, this push in Congress for all these radical ideas that are completely contrary to the vision of our founding fathers, you know, reparations, like I said on your show a couple nights ago, you know, should we get reparations, Jews, because we built the pyramids, you know, thousands of years ago? I mean, the people that live today, you know, are living primarily in freedom. And if there's discrimination, we have to address it. But you don't call everybody a racist that you disagree with. You don't ask them to, to empty out their pockets because 200 years ago, your ancestors weren't treated nicely. You know, and then you have people going on hypocrites like Ben, ben uh, Shapiro. Who, who doesn't even talk about the, the absurdity of it. I was watching him on Fox the other day. He says, well, how do we meet out the reparations? There's no way to do it. Thereby presuming that it's a good idea. You know, I, I was floored. So, yeah. you know, it, it all starts with our leaders. It starts with our universities. It starts with our values. It was John Adams who said, without ethics, morality, and religion, we won't have a lasting liberty. And, and that's why I appreciate you, Jason, is that I know that you and I don't want to tell other people how to live their lives. But when they start threatening us with the way they live their lives, that's a problem. Well, I feel like they're using the media to, in a very subversive way, try to push these ideas, perhaps on people who are not well equipped to defend themselves or uh, think about these things critically. When you talk about the reparations, I look at this uh, Jesse Smollett situation. It feels an awful lot like that was a contrived scenario designed to, you know, hit the media just at the point where Cory Booker wanted to push this anti-lynching bill, which, I mean, obviously it it should be and must be against the law to lynch anybody, but isn't it covered? I mean, isn't it murder to lynch someone? So why do we need another bill to make it illegal? It just seems like a fake news media play to rile up a whole lot of national controversy on late night talk shows from comedians and things like that and create a groundswell of fake support for something that they just want to, push through to make Trump look bad and call him a racist. Right, you're right. A hate crime is a hate crime. You don't need a special hate crime law. And in this case, it was contrived. And we have cases at Freedom Watch. You can go to freedomwatchusa.org against Sharpton, Farrakhan, and, and the rest of them that killed all these people down there in Dallas, either killed or incited the death of the cops down there. So, you know, you don't need hate crime laws to punish people for murder and for assault. Anyway, we'll be right back with the verdict segment of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klingman. As a trial lawyer, he sliced him and diced him. People used to ask me, Larry, what caused you to start Judicial Watch and now Freedom Watch, given the powerful forces in this country that put you at risk? In a meat packing plant. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. A very special prosecutor, Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. I'm back with Jason Goodman in the verdict section of Special Prosecutor with Larry Clayman. Uh, we're talking about our citizens' grand juries, and Jason's going to be there live streaming them. He could be a witness. He's extremely knowledgeable, as you know. I have other witnesses there. You know, our targets are not just Robert Mueller. They're not just Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama. But we've learned recently that Andrew McCabe, the former deputy FBI director, James Comey, the FBI director, Bruce Orr, Rod Rosenstein, and others were all conspiring to conduct a coup of d'etat against the American president. So they're going to be high on our list. And, you know, I was listening just this morning to a former governor of New Jersey, Chris Christie. He was asked a question on Fox News by some of the people there that were Fox uh, Morning News or whatever you want to call it. 
you know, do you think that William Barr, we've talked about that on your show, Jason, is going to be able to proceed with prosecutions of the Clintons and others? And he didn't give any response. He's friends with the so-called Bill Barr. And it's not going to happen at the Justice Department. It's the Department of Injustice. And we see that with the Bundy appeals, with Schaefer Cox, with others that are out there. And that's why these citizens' grand juries are so important. So I hope that you'll go to freedomwatchusa.org because we're beginning them very, very soon. We've already began to uh, get voter lists and such to uh, pick the jurors. We're ready to go. We're teeing it up. But we need to meet out justice ourselves, peacefully and legally. And Jason, you're going to be a part of that. And I can't overemphasize the fact that this Justice Department, which is even the enemy of our president, who sits over the Justice Department as the chief executive, has become the Department of Injustice. Yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about Bill Barr, Larry, because, you know, you and I started talking about him right when he was nominated, before he was appointed. And I've been really looking at his past just in terms of open source information that's available. I was reading an article from The New York Times from 1992 the other day when William Barr was attorney general under George H.W. Bush. And at that time, Senate Democrats were up in arms because Barr refused to appoint a special counsel to investigate H.W. Bush's activities in assisting Iraq just prior to the initial Gulf War invasion. And I think that was a matter where there was ample evidence to investigate real and serious crimes that you know, led to things like the United States had given Saddam Hussein anthrax, weaponized anthrax, that, you know, that came back around in 2001 with all those letters to Tom Daschle and everybody right after September 11th. So it's very interesting that we've got this special counsel who's a personal friend of William Barr and who was the assistant attorney general at the same time that Barr was the attorney general in the 1990s, and he's investigating for two years an alleged not even crime with no evidence. And here we see an attorney general with a track record that is just deplorable in terms of actually pursuing law and order. And to make it worse, you know, I've been trying to meet with Lindsey Graham. You know, he started to sound like a conservative in the last several months. But, you know, he's all talking no action. I've dealt with him before. We've talked about that. And while the president was being basically crucified by Michael Cohen and the rabid leftist Democrats this week, and they asked him for his comment in the hallway of the Senate. His comment was to the effect, well, gee, it's kind of bad form that we have Michael Cohen testify this week. I mean, nothing's going to come out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Lindsey Graham is all talk and no action. He sounds good. I mean, there are worse people up there, believe me. And I hope that he succeeds. But this is a guy who basically, uh, you know, is into himself. We, so we don't have any checks and balances right now. And Freedom Watch, if I may promote ourselves, is really the only game in town. And that's why I'm here doing work right now. I'm not at CPAC. I'm not, you know, high-fiving people because I've got so much darn work with regard to defending Jerry Corsi, with regard to the citizens' grand juries, with regard to the Bundys, with regard to a lot of other people. I could be walking around at a minimum shaking hands, uh, even if I don't pay $250,000 to get a speech like Tom Fitton does. But I don't have time. I just simply yeah. don't have time, and I'll let the results speak for themselves. So we're going to be back next week with another edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Clayman. Jason, thank you for everything you do, and I urge people to go to crowdsource the truth and support Jason because he's so vital to getting the word out. God bless you, God bless America, and God save America. Thank you, Larry.